Thank you, Emma. I appreciate that. Uh, you kept it nice and short. Um, I don't know how, oh, and it's a pleasure to be here at the Clinton School of Public Service. I mean, honor and pleasure. Thank you, Kathy Maton, for suggesting that I be here. I don't know how you spent your afternoon. I was at PL and Smith's Moss Mountain. Uh, it was 80 degrees and sunny. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the same weather. Uh, this is my boss. Uh, he doesn't really bother me much on a day-to-day -day basis, but he left me plenty of records uh, in order for me and the rest of the staff of Mount Vernon to represent the estate as accurately as possible to his time. Uh, he was doing pretty well at this point. He's arriving in New York Harbor. He just uh, won unanimous election as our first president, going heading to his inauguration. And uh, at this point, he's pretty well respected, admired, basically worshiped, godlike. Well, there was a gentleman that decided to try to humanize him just a bit. Oh, yes. Uh, his name was Parson Weems, and so he created some stories, and this is one where Washington supposedly chopped on a cherry tree, but he was so honest that he had to tell the truth. Um, I don't think Washington's admitting to anything in this, this picture. It looks to me as if it's, what, this hatchet? Um, but one thing that very few people know, but they only know because they've come to hear me speak, is that Washington was born with a mature head. Uh, <laughs> And indeed, he was ahead of his time. Now, Washington would never have chopped on any cherry tree or any tree. He loved trees of all sorts. At the age of 16, he's in the Ohio River Valley, and he writes in his journey of my journal, my journal of my journey over the mountains, that about four miles higher up river, we rode through the most beautiful groves of sugar trees. And for the best part of the day, we admired the beauty of the trees and the richness of the land. This is 1748, and this is a man, a, a young man, that, that is admiring the beauty of this country and, and the awe of its magnificence. And anyone that landed on the shores of this country knew that what, wherever they put a shovel, they would find silver, gold, titanium, kryptonite, whatever they may have been looking for, they would find because it was so stunningly beautiful. They saw a forest that was manicured, that they thought was manicured naturally. The forests that they saw that were manicured, that were the work was done by hand. It was really a laborious process to clean a forest of debris and underbrush. Now, of course, it wasn't natural at all. It's because of the practice of the Indians burning the forest uh, each year, but, but they, didn't, they didn't realize that. So um, the, the beauty of the forest, the respect of the land, Washington acquired that at a very early age. Now, when he was 16, he was in the Ohio River Valley surveying. When I was 16, I was playing taps at his tomb. I actually started when I was 13. It was my first introduction. I was the Troop Bugler, Boy Scout Troop 654, Mount Vernon Troop. And every February 22nd, I'd go down and, and play taps. And you, you can't imagine the thrill and the honor of, of standing here. I'm a little older there. Uh, playing taps with all these folks in uniform saluting as you do it. I mean, it was just truly an exceptional experience. I, I remember one time when the, the scoutmaster said, hey, Dean, I want you to do a taps echo. And, I said, okay, and I'd, I'd never done it before. There was no Google, there was no YouTube to, to observe, and so I got my friend John Chilton, and we, we practiced. So, I mean, it seems like a simple process. You know, you play one little bar, and he plays, and, but it wasn't easy. We kept, it just, just wasn't working. So, but the first few times, first little few bars, is, it's not bad, but it, it's just best if I show you. Um. <laughs> so, if you, it, this, this part was easy. See, I could hear. I could hear what he was going to do. That wasn't a problem. This is where it became difficult. So I told John, I said, look, I'm going for it. All I want you to do is hold the last note longer than I do, and we should be OK. So it's done. I'm standing by the tomb, and the scout, my scoutmaster's next to me, and another scoutmaster comes up. And he says, was that beautiful? And did you hear that echo? So uh, <laughs> thank you. So this was the second week of my employment at Mount Vernon. Uh, they dressed me in a uniform made of burlap and gave me a gun taller than me. Now that is a happy 16 year old. <laughs> I'm the cute one, oh dear, that's not me. I'm the cute one to the, uh, to the left right there. But it was a wonderful experience. Now, 
how do you remember George Washington? Maybe as a leader of the Continental Army in the Revolutionary War, and that's great. Because indeed, it was divine providence that allowed the American army led by George Washington to win its independence from Great Britain. Maybe as the first president of the United States, that's not bad either. I mean, unanimously t elected twice. Every move that he made was he was in uncharted territory. Uh, every decision he made would have ramifications for the future. That's really great too. But at the next cocktail party, I want you to remember George Washington as the farmer, because that's what he considered himself foremost to be, a gentleman farmer. He wrote in a letter to a friend that agriculture has ever been amongst the most favorite amusements of my life and devoted the 45 years at Mount Vernon Estate to improving his agricultural practices. Washington also wrote that nothing, uh, in my opinion, would contribute more to the welf welfare of these states than the proper management of its lands. And then continue by saying, and nothing in this state, at least, is least understood. Because he saw the practices of the gentleman farmer being ruinous to the ground. They would farm to exhaustion and then move on. He truly felt that you should be able to acquire a piece of land and farm it, not only during your lifetime, but pass it on to generation to generation. And where he turned to figure out how to do this was to agronomists and uh, uh, agriculturalists in England because he knew that they were landlocked. They had to have figured it out by that point. And so he did. So um, he tried all sorts of different things, crop, different types of crops. By the end of his life, he, was, uh, he had grown 70 different crops. He tried crop, crop rotation. He started with a simple three-year crop rotation, ended up with a seven-year crop rotation, which was more, much more favorable to the land in his pocketbook. Only two years was he actually getting any kind of financial benefit from the crop rotation. Most of those times when he's rotating, it's, it's to allow the land to rest or to heavily fertilize it by herding sheep and other animals on there, let the fertilizer get in and harrow and, and, and plow that in. He followed Jethro Tull's Horse Hoeing Husbandry. This was a book that Tull believed that uh, the more you cultivated the earth, the finer the particles of soil so that the plants could eat more with their lactal mouths. Uh, so Jethro Tull's practice was something he thought would work well, and a lot of plowing and harrowing took place. Washington also enjoyed the 18th century version of Aqualung. <clears throat> and, and he just really liked machinery and, and better ways of, and better practices. This is a 16-sided barn, a, a design that he came up with for the better way of treading wheat. Uh, the horses would go up the ramp and run on the wheat laid out in a specific pattern up top, and then there were cracks in the floors, and the wheat would drop through to the floor below. It was just a much more efficient way, plus it was secure. You could lock it up at night, and, and it wouldn't be stolen. Thievery was a big deal in the 18th century. And above all else, a lot of his agricultural experiments were, were ones that worked out pretty well, but not always that successful. But where he really did succeed was not only was, the father, was he the father of our country, he was the father of the American mule. He requested a jackass from the King of Spain, which he did receive in 1785, and he named it Royal Gift. And he got another one from the Marquis de Lafayette from the Maltese Islands. He named that the, the Knight of Malta. And from that, breeding with the mare, you get a mule, which he did feel would be a, a superior animal to work in the fields. And indeed, it became that. And he took the mules on the southern tour. And he was an entrepreneur. This was another way that he could make more money. So the mule was a very special animal. And, and indeed, by the end of the 18th century, right on up until early 1900s, the 20 mule team was doing so much of the work. So when you're at Mount Vernon um, looking out over the river, this is land that was granted to George Washington, uh, not to George, it was, it was granted by Washington's great-grandfather in 1684. And so when he inherited the property, this is the view that he had. This is a classic example of borrowing the view. He did not own the land across the river, but he could certainly admire it and enjoy it. Check out that little piece of land that's jutting out right there. This is a more current view, and it just has not changed. It's, it's still pretty much as it was during that time. And this is really to the credit of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association um, and their effort to preserve this, this land across the river from development. It, we, it was severely threatened in 1955 when they were going to build an oil uh, a, oil tank farm and a sewage treatment plant across the river. Uh, but luckily for us, the ladies realized this could not happen. 
And not only did we have a vice regent from Ohio, Frances Payne Bolton, but she was also a congresswoman from Ohio. So she was able to buy 400 acres, give it to the National Capital Park Service in Maryland, and that land was protected. So not only at that time, at that time they were just trying to protect the shoreline. Now we are interested in protecting 80 square miles from development because if anybody builds over this ridge and they're 40 feet six and a half inches, we're going to see them. So our effort is to keep it down below this so it will not impede this wonderful view. Now, when visitors come to Mount Vernon today, they look at this view and they just admire it. They think how beautiful it is. What's pretty surprising to me and special is that those visitors in the 18th century felt the same way. Almost all of them that kept a diary or wrote a letter about their visit to Mount Vernon talks about this view. They couldn't believe how beautiful it was. One gentleman, Stephen Hunter, in the 1790s wrote that by nature there's not a sweeter spot in the world. The only thing that enhances this view is the constant movement of sloops up and down the river. And it was a very navigable river, and any painting from the 18th century, this is one done by Benjamin Latrobe, you will always see two and three masted ships coming and going from the Potomac River, coming, stopping at Mount Vernon to pick up whatever he had, going to the docks at Alexandria or Georgetown, heading back out to the Chesapeake, stopping at Dumfries, Virginia, or Port of Tobacco. Just, it was constant movement and how exciting it was, even to the visitors in the 18th century. So here's Washington in New York. He's been spending months developing and, and building his defenses for an obvious and, and, a, and he knows will be an attack from British forces. He's watched 400 ships land in New York Harbor and um, most of them, everything that's on that ship is to annihilate him. And he's writing a letter, a lengthy letter back to his land manager, Lund Washington, and he's sharing his predicament. He says that the enemy has not moved on us by now is incomprehensible to me. That um, we figure on the low side they have 27,000 British, on the high side 30,000 British, and with an additional 6,000 Hessian yet to arrive. If you can find good honey locusts, I think it would make a great hedge. And so he's, he's, he's immediately going from I'm sure to die to what can I do to improve the landscape of Mount Vernon. And what you will find is that Washington and the other founding fathers, whatever predicaments they were in, and usually difficult ones, they were always at home. They were always thinking of their cultivated fields or their gardens. That's where they wanted to be. And what he's talking about here are the groves on either side of the house, to the north and to the south. This side was nothing but locust trees. The other side uh, was where he wanted to plant all of his um, trees that bloomed, especially the clever kinds. And so there you had dogwoods, red buds, lilacs, magnolias, trees such as that. Interesting that he chose this as being the first place that he landscaped because he could allow those trees to get some height to frame the house. 18th century homes didn't have foundation plantings. They were supposed to look as if they had just erupted out of the ground. And so it worked out very well. And this is so new in the development of his plantation. He writes to Lund Washington saying that, make sure you leave me enough space for my work lanes, which he hadn't yet even created. So it's pretty special, 1776 that this was going on. So this is the plan of the estate very early on. This is pre-1785. <clears throat> Small house, four room, one and a half story cottage. Buildings are going off at a 45 degree angle. The gardens are squared, rectangular in shape. Road came straight up what is now the Bowling Green to the house. And this is really common. This is what you would expect. Uh, all your earlier designs were based on straight lines, geometric figures. But Washington purchased a book written by Batty Langley. In 1728 it was written, he purchased his copy in 1759, and Batty Langley was a leader of the new movement in England called the Naturalistic Movement. And Langley's going to teach anyone reading this book how to landscape in a more grand and rural manner than has ever been done before, to lay out parterres, groves, wildernesses, labyrinths, and parks. Everything Langley says, he's going to teach someone how to create within their landscape, Washington added to his new landscape. Um, and so one of the first things he did, and it, this all started January 12, 1785. He'd, he'd return home from the Revolutionary War, War, Christmas Eve, 1783. 1784, he's off to his properties to the west that he felt had been mismanaged. So on January 12th, he says, I'm gonna ride to my mill, swamp, and other locations looking for the sorts of trees and shrubs I shall want for my landscape uh, at my plantation. 
And he had, didn't have to go any further. That was his nursery. Everything that he needed to, to plant this new landscape was in the forest that surrounded Mansion House Farm. Just all the forest trees, the understory trees, the shrubs. It was just everything he could possibly want. So the first thing he did was level the, the road that came straight up. It was actually a sunken road and created a bowling green. Everyone had to have a bowling green. That's a big one. I mean, you could have a tournament out there. And then the curved line. Langley was trying to teach people to landscape more naturally. And the theme of the naturalistic movement is the curved line is nature's gift. He says, once you've seen one quarter of your garden, you should not have seen it all. There's nothing more shocking and stiff than a regular garden. So the serpentine avenues were a welcome addition to this new landscape. And where the road came out a bit created a perfect area to plant shrubberies, which is an English landscape area where you could highlight trees and shrubs of all types. And when you went further out toward the Bowling Green, Betty Langley says, go back to nature. The further you get from the house, go back to nature, go wild. And that's where he planted his wilderness areas. And the wilderness areas I can only show you by a, a landscape model that we did of the estate, because we haven't yet restored them, are down at this corner. And he planted wagon loads of Virginia pine. So he planted them in, let's say, um, March of 1785. And he goes out and sees what the, the men have done. And he says, they're not enough. I want one pine in between every pine you've already planted. He wanted it really, really thick. And then there was a labyrinth of paths that went through it so that the highlight of someone's visit to Mount Vernon was to stroll the gardens and grounds and to get lost within the Virginia landscape and how special that would have been. Views were very important. Vistas had become a very important feature. Washington said, cut a vista to the west to the forest beyond. And this was a mile in distance from his house to the, the gatehouses, which actually are not 18th century. They were built in 1812, but the Ladies Association have made a conscious decision to leave them uh, so that there's actually something you can see when you're looking out, and they're somewhat historic in their own right. Now, the reason this view is as special as it is is because of the classic naturalistic feature, the presence of a ha-ha wall. Ha-ha wall is a hidden barrier. Ha-ha, it just it fools you. So when looking towards it, it does not intrude into the landscape beyond. But it was important because this acted as a physical barrier, keeping domesticated animals, sheep, cows, whatever, on this side of the wall. They didn't want them up on the Bowling Green. The grass was maintained. Everything within the ha-ha walls, and there were three of them, north, south, and west, was called the family living area or pleasure grounds. And it was meant to be maintained at the highest level Washington could do at that time. So mowing of the grass took place every week. And the, the sigh was the, the mower and the sickle was the weed eater. It was quite a, an amazing process. So um, the ha-ha wall kept that pleasure ground and the animals off of it. You didn't want them up there. So this is the only plan we have of the estate. This was done by Samuel Vaughan. He was a landscape designer. He was an English merchant. He actually did some designing at Independence Hall. And here you can see the groves pretty well established. Interesting that the North Grove is a bit out further, but the reason for that is that the South Grove is back so that you could see down the Potomac River. You didn't interfere with that view. But the Serpentine Avenues, the mansion, the work lanes are now in place, and the gardens where they were rectangular in shape, if you remember. He brought them in, but added curved walls to, to be in keeping with the, the theme of the natural movement, the curved line. Um, Langley also stressed the importance of shade. He said every garden must have good shade. And so Washington planted forest trees on either side of the Serpentine Avenue. Langley says if you have to walk more than 20 paces in full sun, your walk is not worth it. We have a few paintings of the estate done by Edward Savage. They're really very accurately done. This is, this is a rendering of a locust tree, which is actually very good. It shows the coach coming up from the south, which makes sense because that's where the paddock was. Bowling Green, Serpentine Avenues even shows the little path going back to the outhouse are necessary. But what's really important here is he shows the cupola off center, which is correct. So many that painted this view decided what Washington couldn't do with the hammer and nail. They'd straighten out with paint and canvas. <laughs> then the other side is really wonderful. Again, you have the ships and the river, a constant presence. The north lane where the, the greenhouse and slave quarters were located. A white fence here. Here's your locust trees. Great view of the ha-ha wall. But what's really neat about this is the Deer Park. Washington on the east, below the east ha-ha wall, created a Deer Park. That was a really important feature to, to have deer out there. 
so that when you were drinking your Madeira or whatever, you could see a deer grazing and, and how exciting that would have been. Um, he bought six English tame deer to stock it. So, um, and, and, the, but the, and he, he surrounded 18 acres with this fence. They fell down very quickly. The deer got away. They just became pets, basically. But, um, and then it just became a park. But I know in Arkansas, you have no problem with deer. Um, <laughs> At Mount Vernon, we've tried different things. We, we try the um, hot sauce and the egg, uh, soap on a rope, hair, that didn't work. But um, the one thing, I don't know if you have this problem, you might, Alan, is chickens. Um, they, are, they pose such a problem for us. And um, they don't really kill anything, they just mess things up. They just scratch a mo nicely mulched area. Well, we have solved that problem. If you um, hang this from a tree, uh, <laughs> that, it freaks them out. And um, now this is original chicken, but I understand barbecue uh, does just as well. So uh, anyway, so this is the house, a beautiful house, a simple house. It's a country house. It welcomed many, many visitors. And it is beautiful, but I don't know what it would have been like if it were not for this lady right here, Anne Pamela Cunningham. She was the founder of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Um, and uh, her mother had gone up rivers, saw the house in disrepair, wrote to her and said, you should take up this, this mission to preserve and protect George Washington's home. She gathered women from across the country. And um, after five years, they raised enough money, $200,000, and were able to purchase the house and 200 acres. And this was their first group photograph out on the piazza. Here is the Houdon bus, and there's Ann Pamela looking right at George Washington. What the ladies may have lacked in overall cuteness, they made up in dedication and foresight. Um, and they went right to work on what they had purchased. This house was in definite need of work. Uh, the, the, their ship's mast uh, actually supporting the piazza from collapsing. There's just a, a lot of work to do. And so they concentrated on the mansion first and the collections to bring them back. Then the outbuildings, they didn't get to the gardens for years. And he didn't need to. If you just pull a few weeds and vines and cultivate the earth, the garden can look a whole lot better real quick. So they, they started working. They got a little nicer coat of paint on there, started planting some trees, and had some props. Gentleman with a high top hat there. Um, and then they got it back to the way it was. And, and they, were, they were thrilled and very proud, and they, they took another group picture. <laughs> and some things just don't change. But... Uh, <laughs> But they recognized that there was a problem, that the house that they had purchased and what they re reconstructed and, and redid, was, there was a mistake. The railing on the top and the sun porch off to the side were later additions, and once they found that out, they removed them. And this is 1930s now that they did this, and, and at that point, the house returned to exactly as it was in Washington's time. Fortunately for us, the house did not go through the Victorian period. It, out of the hands of the Washingtons or the Ladies' Associations where a lot of historic fabric was lost due to bathrooms and closets. So we are very fortunate for that. The first outdoor area that the Ladies' Association actually decided to do work on was the kitchen garden. They decided, let's research this garden, they're talking 1935, and to create a, a garden that will stand the test of time. That was good water, hot spring water, hmm, that's great. Uh, so anyway, the garden was uh, just two terraces, which is correct. Uh, it was on the, to the south, had a great exposure. They actually could bring animals in there to do some cultivation at time. So they did the right thing. They, they followed the same procedure for researching any sort of uh, historic garden or site. You start with your primary research, which was anything directly related to George Washington. So they read his diaries. and. He had a lot of different diaries, recorded the weather each day and what he was doing during that day. They picked up whatever they could that he mentioned about gardens. What about his letters? He wrote thousands of letters. And so you read a lot of that and, and you come up with a line or two of something garden related or, or what have you. So that was very important. Books in his library were really important. What was he reading? What, what sort of practices did he learn from these gentlemen that he would apply to his gardens? And this happens to be Abercrombie and Ma, which is a great resource of, uh, to, to learn about different practices within the garden world. Or Philip Miller, if, if we went back 200 and 
some odd years ago, and wherever we were um, on the social s scale, if we had one book in our library, it was Philip Miller's Gardener's Dictionary. It was just that popular and that important. This happens to be the Gardener's Calendar, where it's telling the gardener what he should be doing in each month of the year in all the different areas, kitchen, fruit, pleasure, conservatory, and nursery. And then designs from the period. This is actually out of Batty Langley's book. He's showing you how to lay out a formal English kitchen garden, and he's showing you different ways you can do it. And this happens to be an area where he's kind of practicing using ovals, and then there was another where he did triangles and hexagons, all sorts of different things. And so from all this, they, they came up with this design. This is 1937 that the kitchen garden was created or recreated. Beautiful garden. Um, you still have your terracing. Gardener's seed house or tool room. This is a uh, wood fence on the top. On the bowling green side, it's very aesthetically pleasing. On the gardening side, it was very practical because they recognized the importance that a garden should breathe. The more air movement you have in a garden, the less diseases that you'll have. Now, in that building right there, uh, that's where I proposed to my wife. She uh, said no, but. Uh, <laughs> But I had something in a little gift bag, and I knew she couldn't refuse. And she said, oh, OK. So actually, um, cisterns or basins, you could tell the wealth of someone by the amount of water that they hauled every day, because the number of plants you were watering, the more plants, the more water. And a cistern or a basin, which was just a dugout like pond area, was a very important part of this garden. The 18th century horticulturists would say, if you do not have a good source of water, don't even try to garden, because you have to have it. Another great benefit of this sort of feature is it's, it's an above ground well. So when you pull water from a deep well, it brings up cold water. When put on plants, it constricts roots, throws them into shock. But this would allow water to be softened and warmed by the sun. And it, using this as a dipping well, it's much more conducive to good plant growth. Um, surrounding your gardens, you, you had espaliers. The, Horticulturists said, surround the quarters of your garden with espaliers. And so they weren't just the single or double arm that we have now. They were four and five arm espaliers. It was a wall of fruit that surrounded these beds. Now, they, they when I say if they, I'm talking the 18th century horticulturists, they felt that this would help protect what was growing within. Plus, you could gather a whole lot of produce and lose very little space to the production of vegetables because it's all being grown in a linear pattern. Uh, a, Pr uh, pruning, grafting of trees was very common in the 18th century. Washington compliments his garden. gardener, says he's very clever because he had three different types of pears growing on one tree. Uh, the coal frames, fresh vegetables in the 18th century was just the most important thing. This garden uh, gate, the lower garden gate was probably closed. No reason for anyone to have to go in there. They knew if it was a fine garden when they sat down to the evening meal uh, with the amount of fresh produce laid in front of them. And so they tried to extend their gardening as best that they could. The garden was surrounded by brick walls, which in its own right created a microclimate. But then to help, they could use coal frames, they could use bell glasses, they could use the southern wall to radiate heat from that. Anything that they could do to extend their season, they tried. Martha Washington had much more to do with this garden than George Washington. George Washington was a designer for a year and a half. He, late, he started January 12, 1785. By the middle of 1786, he's gone. He's hired a gardener. He says, take care of this. I want weekly reports. But he's back farming. Uh, Martha Washington was a very keen plantswoman. And the reason this was such an important garden to her was because one of her main responsibilities was the evening meal. And not only was it meant to be abundant, but also elegant, and if not, it was a direct reflection on her. So during Washington's absences from the estate, and he would write these long letters back, the last line or two was often from Martha to the gardener to make sure that seed had been sown, something had been collected, that you had found the best artichoke seed possible, that old doll had collected enough rose petals to make rose water. It takes four gallons of rose petals distilled to make rose water. So it's a lot of roses she was trying to collect. So there were, these vegetables were just very, very important to her. And in the book, Dining with the Washingtons, which is just a, a wonderful book, it's not just a history book about, or it's not just a cookbook, but it's a history of dining, presidential dining, hospitality, uh, different sorts of recipes. So the gardener, the, the cooks would start their, their morning at 8, 4 a.m. And the gardener would show up around 7.30 with whatever fresh produce that he may have collected from the garden. Martha Washington would, particularly come, would generally come by around 7 a.m. 
But during the winter time, it was important that they had harvested enough and stored for use during the winter season. And so that was behind this door that would have been locked in the full basement of the mansion. Martha Washington was known to walk around the estate with a ring of keys, a, a big ring of keys. So behind this door, there were 700 bushels of potatoes, uh, 100 bushels of turnips and, and plants such as that that they could store. Frankly, the, the butler was supposed to have sanitized this area, the full basement, uh, in, for the acceptance of these root crops and then put up long litter, which was probably straw or corn, against the windows to keep this area uh, from freezing. These vaults would have not only held port, Madeira, and other things like that, but also these bushels of vegetables that we just talked about. So back to the, and, and, the, and the kitchen was just beautiful, and, and in the uh, Dining with the Washingtons, you'll find a recipe for the great cake, and the great cake was something very special made at special events. But they've altered the recipe in the Dining with the Washingtons to requiring three large eggs. Martha's required 40. So um, I think we altered that because so many people died of cholesterol tax after dinner. <laughs> that they've changed it. So back to the garden, it's, it's just totally common to have the paddock next to the kitchen garden. I mean, that goes back to the 14th century because that's your source of fertilizer. And, but they, they knew better than to take fresh and put it right on plants. Washington took it across the road to the dung repository and allowed it to go through a, a heat or decomposition for either a fortnight or two fortnights. So you're talking two or four weeks. Manure was a big deal. Washington, it was really, he saw compost and manure as a salvation of his fields. And he wrote to Arthur Young, a famous agronomist in England, he said, I'm looking for a manner to that's Midas-like, that whatever he touches will turn to manure, the first transmutation to gold. John Adams was in England. He was the um, uh, minister of the court of St. James, and Adams was not one to dress in silk and powder up. But he's, he's going home, and he looks down an alley, and he sees a pile of, of manure. And he, he runs down, jumps in, forks through it, and stands up and says with glee, it does not compare to my own. So it was a big deal. So the garden is, is really beautiful. It's a wonderful example of a formal English kitchen garden, but this is indeed a colonial revival garden. And what that means is it's based as much on historical accuracy as it is beauty. So this probably is not an accurate representation of Washington's garden. That first slide that I showed with just the earthen beds, uh, upper and lower terrace is probably a little more, a better representation. But right now the decision has been made it's kind of my argument to, to keep it like this because of the importance of this garden to not only the history of the Ladies' Association, but also to landscape history within this country because the colonial revival period was a very special time in this country. And so they took another picture. They were so happy. <laughs> and uh, they did lighten up some here. And uh, why not? They're on the ha-ha ball. So from 1980 on, we've been systematically researching different garden beds, and different garden areas to try to represent them more accurately. And this, this is the botanical garden. It's a garden that a lot of people actually visiting Mount Vernon just walk right by uh, because it's just so small and you just don't notice it. But if they knew that this was an area that if Washington was in residence and wanted to get away from life, he was on his knees planting in this garden. He loved working in here. He fondly called it his little garden. He kept wonderful records as far as the number of acorns planted here, started another row here, stopped, then started pecan seedlings. And, and so this garden was not difficult to recreate. And Washington in this garden, because he received a lot of gift of plants, he was looking for plants that were Virginia proof a plant that could survive the harshness of the winter and the harshness of the summer. And so this was a garden to accept smaller plants. It did not require a large area. Whereas the fruit garden and nursery, um, which we redid back in the 1990s, um, was an area to accept larger plants. This was the nursery part of it, and this was the fruit garden. The fruit trees are planted out in the design that Washington actually s stresses in his his paper in the northwest bed, plant this many in the southwest, all this other. This was actually the first time that our restoration, um, we had the, the input from archaeologists. They came out, they dug within here. Um, not only did they find the original ditching, they found the original post holes, and they found root tr uh, fruit tree stains in the ground. So this is a garden that was recreated in its exact location, and it's very accurate to the time. 
Where we, our gardens are not protected by wall, we use pound puppies. There's an invisible fence surrounding it. This is scarlet. We really didn't think scarlet was doing much of anything that she had bought in or was bribed by the deer because they seemed to still be eating so much. But we, we, Scarlett went to a home and we retired her and Scarlett was doing a lot more than we thought because we need to get another dog in there pretty soon. If you want to look at preservation going awry, you want to look at the upper garden. This is a garden that um, has seen more changes than any other garden on the estate. It, it was quite wild at one point. You see, the Ladies Association realized that there were flowers planted within this space and it became their own. They wrote in one line that um, this garden is going to be exactly like George Washington's and it's going to be the prettiest garden in the world. Well, the two don't actually match, but this is the garden that we knew forever. The first camera that entered this garden and took a picture, this is what you saw, parterres, fruit garden, formal rose garden, formal rose garden, long borders, and crescent beds. So that's, that's what we had and that's what we dealt with. Uh, the greenhouse uh, had been restored in the 1950s. We didn't have to worry about that. The parterres had changed over time. They were kind of different, but they'd always been there. They were described by Benjamin Latrobe, who visited Mount Vernon in 1796. He said, for the first time since I left Germany, I saw here a parterre clipped and trimmed with infinite care into the rich form of a fleur de lis. Well, when I started as a boxwood gardener, uh, this is what I inherited, boxwood that was kind of ever yellow, ever yar orange. I don't know if you have those. Um, and when it greened up, it was just as bad. So I decided that I would do something really major. I would replant it. And so I did. I dug a trench and I put in all anything on the market that P. Allen was, was saying was great. I was putting in this ditch. And um, it, it actually, if the lighting was better, this is really quite beautiful. I knew when the ladies would come to, back to Mount Vernon. I so said they used to come in October and they stayed forever. And um, <laughs> the. It, when they came, it was called council. The week before, we called it council light. We were all running around. But I knew that I would get a letter of recommendation, possibly a raise. I think that would have happened if they hadn't all died. They, um, I killed these plants in little less than three months. Um, so lesson learned here um, is that when you dig a hole, what comes out of the hole goes back in the hole. If you change soil st st uh, structure or texture too much, you've created an area where water will not leave that newly created soil until it reaches 100% saturation, which is what's called an anaerobic condition, which means no oxygen and plant roots will start dying within hours. Now you can prove this point when you go home, tie a bag around your head real tight. <laughs> and uh, Anyway, we replanted it, spent a lot of time. Uh, at that point, we purchased boxwood that came in with Phytophthora the root rot. Uh, they died um, after the second planting in about $43,000. I told the ladies, and we were trying to plant English boxwood because that's what Washington did. I said, you know, we shouldn't be planting boxwood as an annual. And they agreed. So after, <laughs> after the third planting, we changed cultivars. We can no longer plant English boxwood within the garden. And so what we're growing now is Morris Dwarf in the center and Justin Brower around the outside. So the rose gardens, uh, we, in, 17, in 1985, we did a research project, a year-long research project. Here they are right here. We recognized very early on they did not belong. They did not do mass plantings in the 18th century. The design was in a Victorian sort of design, which then made sense because we realized the latest association had received a great gift of roses in 1870, and that, so that's how they were created. So we removed them. We brought in simple squared and rectangular beds because when Benjamin Latrobe was visiting, not only did he comment about the parterres, he also said on one side of the grass plat is a neat flower, a plain kitchen garden, on the other side a neat flower garden, laid out in squares and boxed with great precision. So that's what we did. Um, and this is the new design. Roses are now gone. One side was planted with flowers and the other was planted with vegetables because vegetables had all but disappeared from the garden completely. And when you looked at the Gardener's Weekly Reports, they were spending a whole lot more time tending vegetables than they were flowers, so we brought them back. So this is how the garden looked from the aerial view. Now these are the boxwood that I started working in. I would crawl through them and clean them out and work on them. My first year's boxwood gardener, my diary was cleaned out dead wood, cleaned out dead wood, cleaned out dead wood. That's what I did for a year. And I learned early on when a group was coming in and I was right here to be very quiet because if they heard me, they would think I was a rodent and they'd throw rocks at me. So, but, but anyway, you know, there's a lot of folklore about boxwood. Um, long, long life, 
prosperity. Well, we can add another one to that, and that's called love. Uh, because I met my wife in the boxwood at Mount Vernon, and so what happened was Penelope, Tallulah, Zippor, and Isabel. And uh, this is the more current picture of these four daughters, and this is how I protect them. <laughs> So the boxwood, which was lush and green and all around the garden, started dying branch by branch by branch. And it was boxwood decline. And it's something that's wiped out boxwood all around the East Coast. So the hedge that looked like this at one point ended up looking like this. And it came to the time that we had to remove it. And we did. But it would have been wrong to come back and replant boxwood exactly where it was. We allowed the archaeologists to come in and do a serious dig. Now this garden started in 1762 as a fruit and nut garden. So when they dug down, what they found was the 1762 garden. These are the squares that the gardener has dug in pre preparation for the acceptance of a fruit or nut tree. And you can see the organic matter he's added to these beds. Now they've dug that out in these pits, but they found the very bottom layer of where he was preparing this. So we could have recreated it from the 1762 garden, but we were looking for the 1799 garden. That's how we represent the landscaping gardens of Mount Vernon. This is, these are the areas where they dug. Doesn't look like a lot, but we were looking for anything to try to support or dispute the beds that were laid out. And this is probably the most interesting thing that they found is this is a garden, this is 18th century garden tillage. If you look at any 18th century book about preparing a garden, you'll find the, the reference to double digging. They're double digging this, double digging that. And that's exactly what the gardener's doing here. So methodically that he's leaving this little strip of virgin soil untouched. So he's, he's, he's rototilling this with a spade in preparation for some sort of plants. So what the archeologists found that helped us the most is what they didn't find. And that was there were no paths within these huge areas. They, when Latrobe was talking about squares, he's talking about big squares. And we started looking at plants in the 18th century. This is Lady Skipwiss at Presswood and big squares. And then surrounding the squares are your flowers and your shrubs and your trees and, and, um, and roses. So this garden, as we had changed in 1985, we realized it was wrong and we brought in a bobcat. And we scraped it off the face of the earth. We removed the crescents, we removed the long beds and we got it back. Everything is now gone. We returned the 18th century paths, which were always there, back to the, what they were originally. And then the boxwood that had grown to a point that you could barely walk through them, uh, we planted back as the box edging they were meant to be. A box edging was supposed to be no more than three inches by three inches. It was to, to define a line, that's all, not to become a backdrop for perennials. This was its earliest planting, uh, just its first season. And as it matured, the, the perennials and the fruit trees are getting larger. Uh, the artist's rendering of what they thought the garden might look like in five years. And this is what it looked like after the third season. So it was absolutely the most exciting project I've ever been a part of at Mount Vernon. The, the archaeology took five years to get to a point where they could feel that without a doubt, we now kind of knew what was going on. And we saw an 18th century re reborn right before our eyes. We talked about a um, time capsule. What could we put? Where could we put it? I just suggested burying two archaeologists. <laughs> archaeologists and horticulturists typically do not get along. Um, so burying them I thought was a perfect idea. But you can be at peace because I'm done. But if there is a... And what's interesting about the Dove of Peace is the Dove itself is is newly been created and put back, but the north, south, east, west is 18th century. They can't remove it without dismantling the, the cupola, so they leave it. But if there is a pot of gold as far as historic sites are concerned, I would have to think it's at Mount Vernon. I, I love what I do. I'm honored to be there and to, to work for a group of, of women that actually respect staff and allow them to do their work and research. Um, and we've gotten it to the point that I truly feel we can say welcome home George Washington because if he were to walk through that gate today, I think he would feel right at home and, and that's what I'm most proud about. So thank you very much, appreciate it. All right, we've got time for a few questions. If you would raise your hands, if you have a question, and we'll bring the microphone to you. Surely in this group, there are questions. 
There's one right back here, yes. Would you give us an idea of um, the time frame here of the development of this plantation? It had been three generations, is that correct, by the time George Washington was there? By the, by the time the ladies, since the ladies association well, or from? No, I was thinking of, uh, in essence, you were talking about the archeology span going right. down through. Um, oh. You know, the generations of plantings that had been there. Right. They found every single um, time that anyone scratched the earth in that garden. I think they found three different periods of that garden as they would continue down until they got to ground that had not been yet touched. Uh, the soil level on the entire estate seems to have risen over time. Um, kind of interesting uh, why that would happen, but it's the case. The original cobblestone road right in front of the mansion is now under three inches of, of soil. So yeah, go figure. But, um, but they did get back down. Those gardens were created in the 1760s, and they did go through all those periods till they got to that point. Question? Yeah, uh, yes, Robert. Hey, sir. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait for the microphone. It's coming at you. Are the trees at Mount Vernon the ones George Washington planted, or have they been replanted, or is it a mixture of both? It's a mixture of both. We, we have, the Ladies Association have always taken great pride in their trees and the care of them. Uh, they sought the, what they felt was the, the best tree specialist who happened to be, in their eyes, Charles Sprague Sargent, who is the head of the Arnold Arboretum Harbor Zone. And he came and worked at Mount Vernon from 1917 to 1926, advising them on trees that should be removed and the care of those trees. He did a plan of the estate, and on that plan, walked around looking at trees, and on this plan he shows what he thought were original trees. So not that long ago, we thought we still had 13. But then we had dendrochronologists come from Oxford, England, and they were there to date the beams within the house. But someone decided, well, let's have them core the trees. Well, I thought we had a perfectly good story going. I didn't see why we needed to, but they did. And it ended up Sargent wasn't very good at identifying trees that were 18th century. So we went from 13 to three. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, one of them that I would have bet two of my children, because there was a time that I would have been glad to get to go, uh, <laughs> I thought was 18th century. It was huge. The largest trunk tree we have, it was 1819. And they got, they, they hit dead center. So the two tulip poplars outside of the upper garden gate do date from 1785. And then there's a hemlock that was sent to Washington as a gift from Governor Clinton in New York. It arrived at Mount Vernon in a half whiskey barrel and, he, and Washington planted it outside the upper garden gate. So we know exactly what was going on there. We now know that we have around 15 original trees on the property, but most of them are out away from the historic, the, the main core of the historic area. The oldest tree that we found predates 1683. So it's pretty neat. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Mark, back here. Uh, did they have an herb garden? Well, they didn't. Well, they did, but they didn't. I mean, they never mention herbs whatsoever. Um, and, wa and what you find there, sir, is that they didn't mention those things were just commonplace. They, they just were there. And it wasn't a specific herb garden, but the herbs would have been planted within the, the kitchen garden. And the upper garden, which was the pleasure garden. See, Washington wanted a new landscape, the reason he did that landscape, to reflect the man that he had become. And so a Bowling Green, Serpentine Avenues, Fine Kitchen Garden, Upper Garden, Pleasure Garden were, were a very important part of that. But he didn't dare take that upper garden space and devoted all the flowers. He wasn't that crazy because vegetables were still the most important part of gardening. So he surrounded them with just a small border of flowers. What would make that garden act absolutely perfect would be those espalier trees at the back of the flower borders, because then you would not see any, it would create the room uh, that he was trying to create within there. So the herbs would have been all over the place, not in one specific area. How much of the garden is open to the public? Uh, everything. Oh, it's, it's totally open. It's, uh, Mount Vernon has really blossomed, let me say. Um, People used to come to Mount Vernon and spend a couple hours. They're there now all day and sometimes visit the next day. There's so much to see and do. Um, not only do we 
have the historic core. We've created a pioneer farmer site where we represent Washington the farmer. We, we have a working grist mill. As President of the United States, one of Washington's um, jobs was to sign U.S. patents. The patent service had just started. And the third patent that crossed his desk was from Oliver Evans for a fully automated mill. He signed it and immediately called Oliver. Uh, and he has, he has a fully automated mill, which is working at Mount Vernon. And then his distillery. We've rebuilt the distillery. And we have a very happy staff at Mount Vernon. Uh, <laughs> We all believe in the power of the drink, and he, he, he um, distilled 11,000 gallons of, of, of rot gut whiskey and sold it all within a matter of months. He, actually, he made more money off of the whiskey distillery than any of his other uh, ventures, and, he, and it came up from a Scotsman. A Scotsman said, you know, you've got to distill and make whiskey, so Washington agreed, and it, and it really worked out well for him. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. Question. First, I, I've seen your wonderful work, and I want to compliment that. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, you said that this is an inherited property, and I did not realize that. Was there a home site of any sort there before Washington built Mount Vernon? Lawrence Washington built the first home. Uh, he, Lawrence Washington actually was the one that named it Mount Vernon after Admiral Vernon, who he had served in in the British Navy. Uh, so that was what was there, and probably small gardens of some sort. So, it, well, by the time Washington inherited, you had those, those square gardens, so that's basically what he had. So we took it from that point. And three additions later, uh, adding the two-story addition, then the study and bedchamber, and finally what we now call the new room, which was finally finished upon his return from the presidency. Mm -hmm. There was a follow-up over there. Did you have another question, man? You, you were going to ask something else. What's, go ahead. Give. Yes, well, let's get the mic. Let's go back here. Let, oh, okay. Sorry. We'll go. Yeah, let, yes. I just had a simple question. The, when it showed you finally went through with the bulldozers and cleaned all that out, when was that? That was five years ago, 2009. Yeah, two, yeah, you got to come back. Yeah, no, it, it was very recent. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Okay, we have a question right here. Wait a minute, ma'am. Wait for the microphone, please. Uh, where did George Washington get the seed from, the ve the, his uh, vegetable seeds? Do you know that? Did they come from England? Um, no, we, we don't actually know where he ordered his vegetable seed, but one thing that we do know is that he would get very angry when, after he had acquired a plant, that seed had not been collected or the plant had not been divided for the following year. He thought it was really reputable to the farmer if you had to seek a plant after you had once gotten it. So he was really big on seed collection and preservation of what plants he had. <laughs> 